Hi, I'm Lucy, and I'm totally not a robot. In the previous videos in the series, I've been building this breadboard computer. So far, it has the Intel 8086 microprocessor, three latches that demultiplex the address and data bus, a couple ROM chips that serve addresses starting with an F, and plenty of debugging LEDs. Most recently, I've built an EEPROM programmer, and I was able to write custom data into the ROM chips, and have it recognized by the computer, such as here, where you can see 5533 on the data bus, in the upper right corner. And while this technically worked, you could hardly call that programming. It was just a bunch of random values, easily recognizable on the LED bars, and generated with a Python script. It was enough to influence the computer's behavior, but realistically, nobody programs computers by directly writing opcodes. So in this video, I'd like to see if we can do better, and have a look at assembly programming. Let's disconnect power, and get rolling. I'll start by opening an empty file called test.asm. I won't be too ambitious at the beginning, I'll just try to recreate the same six bytes as last time, but using assembly instead of Python. In a previous video, while disassembling the FF opcode, we've seen that the DB keyword can be used to define a data byte. So what I can do is to just declare my six bytes as data, and see if that works. I'll save the file, and use a tool called NASM, to literally assemble the binary from the source code. This will cut off the .asm suffix, and create a file called test, that contains the binary output. And that's what I can then check with hexdump. It seems to have worked, the file is 6 bytes long, and these are the exact 6 bytes, that I've defined in the source code. But you know, it's just 6 bytes, I need the ROM image to be 64 kilobytes, and what's more, I need these 6 bytes to land at address FFF0. So let's see if I can somehow pad the file to the correct size. A very common way that the internet will suggest, is to use the times keyword, which goes something like this. What it means, is that I want to repeat the instruction db0xff, as many times as necessary to go from where I currently am in the program, which is what the dollar minus double dollar expands to, all the way up to address FFF0. Let's save the file, reassemble the binary, and see if it works. And look at that, we now have a file full of FFs, in other words full of ones, all the way up to address FFF0, and then our six bytes. But clearly, the file is not 64 kilobytes in size, we're still missing the padding from the other side, so let's quickly add that. That's almost it, I'm still missing one last byte, but that's my bad, I need to go all the way to address 10000 in the times command. And that's it, this is now a 64 kilobyte file, with my code starting at address FFF0. I'd say it's no longer a test, it clearly works, so let's get rid of the test binary, and rename the source file to rom.asm. But now I need something, that takes the 64 kilobyte image, and splits it in half, into high and low. And I think I'll just reuse the Python script from last time, let's copy it to splitrom.py, and start editing. I can get rid of all the byte generation bits, and instead, I'll just read ROM from standard input. I know the size of the ROM file, and it's always a good idea to limit reads, so I'll actually read exactly 64 kilobytes. And I think standard input is by default open in text mode, and I need to use stdin.buffer to read in binary mode. The last change that I need is to get rid of the array joins, as reading from standard input will give me a proper byte string straight away. And that should be all, let's run the tool, pipe the ROM image into it, and see if it works. Of course, I first had to run nasm rom.asm, to get the ROM file, but that somehow mysteriously vanished from the video. Nevertheless, the split ROM tool clearly works, which is great. I could now write this to the ROM chips, and try to run it on the computer, 
but what would be the point? It's the same as last time, just generated from assembly code. Instead, let me use the source code as a skeleton for a slightly more interesting program. First, let's get rid of all the data bytes and then I'll start writing the program. I'll stick with the nicely recognizable values, and I'll start by moving 3355 to the AX register. Then, I'll move F0CC to the DX register. And next, I'll use the out instruction, which should take the data from the AX register and write it to the IO address, or I guess the correct term for the 8086 is IO port, stored in the DX register. And if you want to ask, why the hell isn't the address stored in the AX register and the data in the DX register? Don't ask me, ask Intel. Anyway, what that means is that at some point, we should see the 8086 issue right, with the MIO signal low, F0CC on the address bus, and 3355 on the data bus. But that's not all, I'm slightly more ambitious with my first program. So next, I'll do a very similar thing, out instruction again, but I'll use the AL register instead of AX. AL represents the lower 8 bits of the AX register, so in my case 55. The important thing here is that it's an 8 bit value, so this way it should only trigger a transfer on the lower part of the bus. Which means we should see the BHE signal high during that transfer. But that's still not everything. Both of these were writes to an even address, I want to try the same thing writing to an odd one. So to do that, I'll move F055 to the DX register and start by writing the 8-bit AL value to it. This should also trigger an 8-bit transfer, but this time on the high part of the data bus, so that's where we should see 55, and this time the BHE signal should be low. And finally, I'll try a 16-bit transfer to the odd address, which is going to be interesting, because if you remember, for odd addresses the lower part of the data bus is disabled, so there's simply not enough space to fit a 16-bit value. Anyway, that's my test program for various bus transfer modes, let's now save the file and assemble the binary. Once again, let's use hexdump to check the contents. Okay, there's something at address FFF0, and without context you'd probably say that it's just some binary garbage. But knowing what I've written into the code, I can kind of recognize some pieces. B8 has to be the move to the AX register, because that's the first instruction in my program. Then 5533 is almost the value that I'm moving into it, it's just backwards for some reason. BA is similar to B8, that's going to be the move to the DX register, and right after it, CCF0 is the value that I'm moving, again with the bytes flipped. And this is because the 8086 uses a so-called little endian byte ordering, which means that words, or any multibyte values, are stored in memory backwards, highest byte goes the lowest address, and the lowest byte ends up at the highest address. Whether that's a good thing or not, is a completely different discussion, I can do absolutely nothing about it, and the important thing is to just understand how it works. So moving forward, there's EF and EE, and these are most likely opcodes for the out instruction, first 16 bits wide, and then 8 bits. And finally, BA55F0 is the second move to the DX register, followed by EE and EF, the last couple out instructions. Let's actually disassemble the ROM file, and see if I got it right. And it looks like I did, I mean, not that there were too many alternatives, but still. It's interesting to see, how the code that I wrote, transforms into just a few bytes. But enough reverse engineering, let's now split the image into high and low, and write it to the ROM chips. In order to do that, I have to remove the chips from the computer, and put the first one into the programmer. And remember not to mix them up, the left chip drives the high half of the bus, and the right chip drives the low half. With that in place, I can now use Minicom to write the image to the first chip. But there's one thing I want to do first, if you remember, last time I had to run Minicom as root.
and that's quite impractical and not really necessary, all I need to do is to add myself to the dialout group, and I'll be able to access serial ports as a regular user. The settings don't get applied immediately though, I either need to reboot, or I can use the new group command. And just like that, I can now launch Minicom from my home directory. Here I can use Ctrl AS to send a file, pick the Xmodem protocol, and just use the arrow keys to find the file, tag it with space, and send to the programmer. There it goes, chip swap, and do the same for the other chip. Boom, done, out of the programmer, and into the computer. You know the drill, power, reset sequence, and here we are at address FFFF0. Stepping one clock pulse further, the data is B8 and 55, which is correct, so let's move forward. At address FFFF2, the data on the bus is 33, and BA, correct again, let's proceed. Address FFFF4, CC, and F0. And moving forward to FFFF6, the data is EF and EE. So now the 8086 has read the first couple out instructions, and hopefully, they get executed soon. But apparently not immediately, as the next address is FFFF8, so it looks like it's continuing to read the program, BA and 55. But look at that, arriving to the next T1, the address changes to F0CC, and the MIO signal is low, so it must be an IO address. Let's step the clock one pulse further, and look at that. The 8086 is clearly issuing a write, and the data that it's writing is 3355. And it's clearly a 16-bit transfer, because the address is even, and BHE is low, so that's amazing, that means everything is working as it should. One question that comes to mind, is why is suddenly the data on the data bus the other way around? While reading the program, I always had to read it right to left, because that's just how I have it wired, the low byte is on the right, and the high byte is on the left. So why am I now saying it's 3355, and not 5533? As I've mentioned a few moments ago, this is a little endian system, which means that multibyte values are stored backwards. And because I have the LEDs wired backwards, and then the microprocessor also stores the value backwards, this cancels out, and ends up being readable left to right. And I understand it might be confusing, but it is what it is. But back to the execution, it looks like we're back at address FFFFA, reading more of the program, namely F0 and EE. Stepping forward, it looks like we're back at IO address F0CC, and it's actually very similar. The microprocessor is clearly issuing a write to IO address F0CC, but this time the BHE signal is high, which means we should ignore the high half of the bus, whatever value there is, it's just not valid, we're only transferring the lower byte, 55. Next we return to address FFFFC, to read more of the program, and in this case the data is EF and FF, which indicates that we've reached the end of the program, and from now on, we'll only get FF, which is the byte that I've chosen for padding. And that's indeed the case for address FFFFE, but after that, it looks like the 8086 has decided to move to another IO address, this time F055, just as my program has instructed. I would like to emphasize that this is an odd address, so the A0 signal is high, which means it's the lower half of the data bus that is now disabled. And because BHE is low, it looks like we're going to transfer 8 bytes on the upper half of the bus. Let's pulse the clock to see the actual data. That looks alright, the 55 has moved to the upper half of the data bus, and we can of course ignore the lower half, because it's disabled. But what's this? A few more clock pulses, 
and it looks like everything just turned off. But ALE is high, so there must be an address on the address bus, so is the 8086 actually trying to access address 00000? And indeed it is, what happened is a simple overflow, we've increased the address FFFFE by 2, but that would be 100000, a 21 bit long value. But the 8086 doesn't have enough bits to represent that number, so the 21st bit is lost in the void, and what remains is just zero. And of course, we have nothing wired to address zero, our ROM chips only activate for addresses that start with an F, so the data bus will just contain garbage, but at this point I don't care too much. We only have one last instruction to execute, the 16-bit write to an odd address, and that one's already been read correctly. So I'll just continue pulsing the clock, and it should be fine. And it looks like it is indeed, because the F055 address is back. This being T1, it's on both the address and data buses, but when I pulse the clock, the data appears on the data bus, and wait. This looks exactly the same as before. It's an odd address, and BHE is low, so it's only transferring the upper byte, 5 5. So did it just ignore the other half? Let's go a bit forward and see what happens. And whoa, that's something new. So the address has apparently incremented to F056, which is weird, I didn't have that number in my code. Let's pulse the clock one step further and see what happens. Okay, BHE is now high and it's an even address, so the 8086 is apparently performing an 8-bit transfer on the lower half of the data bus. Looking there, the value is 33, which suggests it might actually be the second half of our 16-bit transfer. And you know, that's incredibly clever. So I've instructed in the code that I want to write a 16-bit value to address F055, which means the two bytes would land at addresses F055, and F056. And the 8086 was smart enough to detect that this is a problem, because it can't put those two addresses on the data bus at the same time. The even address on the data bus is always the lower one, and the odd address is then just a plus one, so it could have F054 and F055, or F056 and F057, but neither of those is what it needs. So it's decided internally, to split the 16-bit write that it can't perform, into two smaller 8-bit writes that it can. And that should be the end of my program, so let's just pulse the clock a few more times and see what happens. First it tries to read from address 00002, and then continues to our old friend 07FFE, which means the computer has started executing garbage. And that's where I'll leave it for this video. I think I can call this a success, I now have a way to write programs in assembly and execute them on the computer, which is pretty cool. I do realize that the last couple videos were mostly software, and I haven't really added anything new to the computer, but I can promise you that I'm going to do some quality building in the next one. Until then, stay tuned.